there. Thank you for joining us. We're so glad you're here. We're in a life-changing series called Seven Kingdom Laws for a Significant Life. To grasp Jesus' understanding on God's kingdom, we must understand it operates on laws. These laws are biblical truths that will not only give you a significant life, but also draw you closer to God. Last week, Pastor Tony focused on the law of righteousness. Our highest life is realized when we pursue righteousness, goodness, kindness, selflessness, and genuine respect for others. This week, Pastor Tony is going even deeper into the law of righteousness. Pastor Tony Scott is the senior pastor at the Church Mommy in Mommy, Ohio. Pastor Tony Scott takes you deep into the Word of God so that you can go wide in your living. Whether you are a new or seasoned Christian, you will learn something from his messages. If you're looking for truth and substance, you've come to the right place. We don't water it down here. If you're local, we'd love to see you in person at one of our worship services. Sure, we're all smiles at the church. We socialize safely, worship to beautiful music, and yes, we have lights and cameras. But what we are really passionate about is Jesus, the presence of God, and going deep into his word. If you're looking for a church that goes beyond the surface, join us next weekend. This week's message is called Seven Kingdom Laws for a Significant Life, The Law of Righteousness, Part 4. Our prayer is that it blesses you, draws you closer to God, and encourages positive life change. Listen as Pastor Tony Scott explains righteousness. So every life is basically a story of perpetual becoming. I just want you to say those two words, perpetual becoming. Now, come on, you have a louder voice than that. I want you to say perpetual Perpetual. becoming. Becoming. Say, I am becoming. becoming. As long as you are breathing, you are becoming. You never arrive. You will never be the totality of who God created you to be on any given day that you're alive on this earth because your potential is unlimited. Who you can become, what you can do is unlimited. So every one of us, in response to that thought, is called to live a life of righteousness. The only possibility of living in harmony with the universe is to live a righteous life. Live by the law of righteousness. So the Bible teaches us one thing about righteousness that is probably the most important thing. Inside of our DNA... God hardwired us for righteousness. We are hardwired to do right. The worst person on the earth has right thoughts at some time. And so God wired us from within to live a righteous life. So righteousness is not something that I do as a task. It's not a task assigned to me to to perform, but it's the result of my complete surrender to the kingdom laws of God. I surrender to God in my life. He gifts me with righteousness through his son, Jesus Christ, by his death upon the cross. So you and I are blessed to be in Christ. Say in Christ. Just for a moment, go go back to the Garden of Eden with me and listen to the voice of God as he's speaking to Adam and Eve and he sets forth a principle for relationships, both divine and human, that shall always be in effect, even throughout eternity. This law of relationships will never cease, and it's called the law of oneness. Say the law of oneness. And what does he say? He said, the two shall come together in a marriage, Adam and Eve. God performed the first ceremony. And the two shall become one flesh. Say become one flesh. Become one flesh. So become is a process. So you don't go to the altar and become one flesh. You actually don't even go to the altar and get a marriage. You get an opportunity to create a marriage. And then it takes the rest of your life to learn how to live with each other and be one with each other. But in essence, he's giving us a principle of oneness that starts with God. He says, I want you to be one with me. I want you to come into a oneness with me. So you're going to be in Christ, and Christ is going to be in you. That's oneness. We become one with Jesus, 
And we become one with the Father, just like God and his Son are one. God, his Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. All three in one. Why does he want us to be in Christ? Because Christ is our righteousness. I just want you to say, Christ is my righteousness. I want you to look at someone and say, Christ is your righteousness. So from our position in him, of being in him, one with him, remember, becoming one with him, Say, becoming one with him. So in the course of your life, in the process of your life, you are becoming one with Jesus. The more of God's word you pour inside of you, the more you yield to the word, the teaching of the word, and the Holy Spirit himself, the more God reveals himself to you, the more you become one with Christ. The more you become one with Christ, the more you live by the laws of the kingdom. God enables us, empowers us, equips us to live by his kingdom laws. So we're placed in Christ, a position of righteousness. And then he says to us, I want you to walk this out. I want you to practice righteousness. I want you to practice it. I want you to live it. I want it to come out in your speech, your words. I want it to come out in your actions and your deeds. I want it to come out in every relationship you have, how you treat others, how you speak to others, how you respond to others. I want you to do it in righteousness. And this walk of righteousness, this walk of what I would call practical righteousness from our position of righteousness protects us. There is a protection in righteousness that you and I need because passions are redeemed and redirected as we become righteous. He redeems our passions. Our flesh has certain passions that are sinful. You are tempted at times to do things. You rise up in anger. That's a passion, by the way. And you're tempted, you're tempted to say something, to do something in anger. And, and God said, I, I want to redeem that passion, and I want to redirect that passion. And he does that by righteousness, by the law of righteousness. So what he wants us to do is develop a positive mindset. Say positive mindset. This positive mindset gives us an understanding of our righteous position in Christ. We are seated together with Jesus in heavenly places, and it gives us boldness and confidence and freedom to become everything God created us to be. He said, I want you to explore your entire being. I don't want you to use a portion of your brain. So righteousness does two things. It overpromises and it overdelivers. It overpromises and it overdelivers. It overpromises because you and I will never be perfect in our righteousness. And so Righteousness is laid out as if there is a perfection stage. You and I, because we're human, we'll never get there. But we can always increase in righteousness. So it overpromises, but then it overdelivers on a consistent basis. God will continually bless you with favor if you pursue righteousness, if you go after him. All of us, every one of us, have four powerful life endowments. Say four. four. Powerful life endowments. I'm going to walk through these slowly because I want you to get this. This is really important. This is how we really live a life of righteousness. And the first one of those endowments is self-consciousness or self-awareness. Say self-awareness. When we talk about self-awareness, we're literally talking about knowing and living my true God self, becoming everything God made me to be, my highest life. I don't want to live my best life. I want to live my highest life. There's something better than best. The highest. I want to live my highest life. What does that mean? If I'm self-aware, if I'm self-conscious, I begin to know myself. It means that I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. It means that I know what my emotional triggers are. I know what sets me off. I, I know what makes me happy. I know what makes me sad. I know what makes me energetic. I know what makes me lethargic. I, I understand my personal belief system, say PBS. Everybody has a PBS. That's your personal belief system. Your personal belief system is formed out of everything that has come into your brain. 
Everything that you have believed as truth or rejected as heresy. That forms your personal belief system. On a daily basis, you are developing your PBS, your personal belief system. And you will live by your personal belief system. You will filter everything in your life by your personal belief system. Whether you realize it or not, consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously, you are filtering things through who you believe that you are. You believe you're this certain person. You believe this about life. Everything gets filtered through your PBS. So becoming more aligned with who God created me to be gives me a proper PBS, a personal belief system. The more I believe in God, the more I believe in his word, the more of his word that gets inside of me, the more I yield to the Holy Spirit. I become the person he created me to be. Two things are important about that. Number one, you look outside of yourself to dream and to envision. To dream, to envision how life can be for me. What I want to do with my life. What do, what do I want to achieve? Where do I want to be in a year, two years, five years, ten years? How long do I want to live? How healthy do I want to be? That's dreaming. That's envisioning. You do that outside of you. But you look inside of yourself to become, let me use the proper word in this generation, woke. People are talking about being woke. You cannot be woke from what happens outside. You can only be woke from what happens inside. Something has to happen on the inside of you. And so when you become fully aware, self-conscious, self-awareness, you then become adequate for whatever life brings if you truly know who God made you to be. If you just know what God said about you and you believe what God said about you, it doesn't matter what happens in your life. You're going to find a way through it. You may never get over it, but you can get through it. So now we should discuss who God says you are. What does God say about you? You should know this. This should be a verse everybody should memorize. You should never forget this verse. This verse tells me my relationship with God who I am in him, and what God has in store for me. This is the verse. This is the one verse that wraps it all up. Ephesians 2 and 10. Let's read out loud together, everybody. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship. Now, let's just stop long enough to dissect some of the words. If I'm going to be God's handiwork, his workmanship, I should know what that word means. In the Greek, it's the word poema, which means poem. I'm God's poem. Think about that for a moment. Next time you're looking in the mirror getting ready, just look at yourself and say, I am God's poem. That should do something for you. So what is a poem? It rhymes. So God is going to develop a rhythm out of your life. He's going to bring things to pass in your life that while they don't make sense at the moment, will eventually make sense. He's going to write something about you. You're his work of art. Look in the mirror and say, I am God's work of art. You know, sometimes people will look at you and say, you're a real piece of work. You should say, yes, I am. I'm God's piece of work. You know what they meant by that, but then you need to know what God means by it. I am God's piece of work. See? All right, so, so let's read on. Recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may... Okay, stop. Do those good works which God predestined. Are you doing the works that God predestined you to do? Are you actively engaged in the works that God put you on the earth to do? You say, how would I know that? Your gifts, talents, and abilities will tell you something about that. Your opportunities in the kingdom of God will tell you something about it. Your desires to serve God will tell you something about that. He predestined. He planned beforehand some things he wanted us to do. Read on with me. For us taking paths which... He prepared, okay, just stop for a moment. Your life was planned by God before you became an embryo in your mother's womb. Half of you didn't even believe that when I said it. Before you were an embryo in your mother's womb, before the sperm met the egg and you become an embryo, became an embryo in your mother's womb, God knew you and wrote a book about your life. This is what Paul is saying. He already knew what he wanted from you. And I know what some of you are going to say. Well, I sure messed that up. So did I. I really messed that up for God. But then God redeems our detours. 
He just turns things around, gets us right back on course because he said, I have a purpose for your life. And I'm gonna work my purpose in your life if you will let me. We do have to cooperate with God. So keep on reading with me that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged. Say good life. <clears throat> so, so the only place in the Bible that I'm personally aware of, besides Psalms 139 and Ephesians 2 and 10, these are the only places in the Bible that I know of that God specifically states my future on the earth. I have works for you to do. The question you should be asking yourself every day, am I engaged in the works that God created me to do? Am I doing what he put me on the earth to do? Self-awareness, say it out loud. Look at someone and say, are you self-aware? Do you really know your God self? Number two, conscience, say conscience. We are able by our conscience to discern right from wrong. What's the right thing to do versus the wrong thing to do? The voice of our chosen value system <clears throat> comes through our conscience. The voice of our chosen value system. Listen to me. What you value will determine your decisions. It'll determine your choices. What do you value? Conscience is a moral muscle. It is a moral law, a code written inside of us, inside of our conscience where the voice of God speaks to us. It causes you and I to want to be a light in a dark world, causes us to want to do the right thing. It convicts us. We are convicted by our very conscience on a continuing basis. John chapter 8, verse 9, let's read together. Then those who heard it being convicted by their, went out one by one. Convicted by their conscience. Number three, free will. Say free will. Now remember, these are life endowments. These are four things that God gives to every individual on the face of the earth. Nobody in any country on the earth is without these four things. Free will. That's the power to choose, to decide for oneself. Theologically, it is being able not to sin. Just say this out loud. Able not to sin. God sanctifies us by the power of the blood and the word in order that we are set apart, we are separated, which the word sanctified means, set apart for a holy use. No one is sinless, but we all can choose not to sin. Before Adam sinned, he was able not to sin. Jesus came and declared that you and I can be able not to sin. We can get to that place in Christ that we can make that decision and that choice. John 8, 32, let's read together. And you will know the truth and the I wish somebody would write that verse from the original Greek language. I searched several translations, and none of them really got it totally right. And, and I, I don't say that to mock anybody's um, writing of the Word of God and what they think. But the word know there is the key to that verse. You can know truth and never be free. You can know truth and be a slave. You can know Jesus saves and never be saved. So truth does not set you free. So the key to that verse is the word no. Say no. So it's used way back in the book of Genesis when it says Adam knew his wife. You don't need me to, under, to make you understand what that means. He knew his wife and she had a child. That should finish it for you. So he became one with her is what it's saying. And so when you become one with the truth, then the truth you become one with will set you free. That's what he's telling us. We can be free. Let's continue on. Romans chapter 6, verse 18. Read, and having been set free from sin. Say set free from sin. Do you think the Bible means what it says? Because this Bible tells me I can be free from sin. I can be able not to sin. Say able not to sin. Okay, so let's read it again. And having been set free from sin, you have become the servants of righteousness of God conformity to the divine will and thought 
purpose, and action. When you have a free will, your free will is given to you by God to perfect your being. He said, I want you to be, be able to perfect yourself through my word and by my spirit. Number four, creative imagination. Say creative imagination. Now, what is creative imagination? Creative imagination is the doorway to the infinity of your being. It is the absolute utmost you at your highest life. You have no clue as to what you could do. I just want you to think about this with me. What are you capable of that you haven't done? Creative imagination. Say it out loud. Creative imagination. It's the doorway to the infinity of my being. It's what God put inside of me. It's all that you have the potential to become and do. There are no limits. Now, I know you're looking at me like, can you prove that by the Bible? I actually knew you would ask that. And here it is. Let's read together. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and now nothing they have, say imagine, they can do will be impossible for them. I just want you to think about that for a moment. If you imagine it, Psychologists tell us that when we start imagining things that we can do, energy starts rising up inside of us. Our brain begins to work on all of its cylinders. Creative imagination. Say it out loud. Creative imagination. When these four life endowments are properly expressed with a righteous consciousness, which we've talked about for the last three weeks, we receive the ultimate human freedom. This is the ultimate human freedom. The power to choose, to respond to the challenges of life and the ability within us to transcend, to transition, to change, to shift our direction. That's all up to us. We can decide. You should never sit in a chair and think about your life and think about how limited you are. You are not limited unless you decide to be limited. How big can it be? Let's go back to Psalms 92 one more time. The uncompromisingly righteous shall flourish. Say flourish. Flourish like the palm tree. Be long-lived, stately, upright, useful, and fruitful. They shall grow like a... Cedar in Lebanon, majestic, stable, durable, incorruptible, planted in the house of the Lord. They shall flourish in the courts of our God, growing in grace. They. Wow. That's what we were just talking about, wasn't it? Say, so why are you preaching all this stuff? It's the Bible. They shall bring forth fruit in their old age. They shall be full of sap, of spiritual vitality, and rich in the verdure of trust, love, and contentment. Now, why does God use trees to tell us about life? What does it mean? What does an evergreen tree mean to our Christian faith? A palm tree. The cedar is an exogen. Say exogen. This is an exogen. An exogenous tree grows right inside the bark outwardly. Oldest and hardest wood is right here in the center. Newest wood is out here. So it's expanding. It's getting larger. And endogenic, well, let me, let me stay with exogenous first. It has rings. So if you slice it into, count the rings, you know how old that tree is. It can grow up to 150 feet. This is an evergreen. It can grow limbs that are 300 feet long. Solomon's temple had cedar trees, evergreen trees, that held up, that were used to hold up the roofing system, brace the temple. A righteous person's character is ever growing and expanding outwardly as the world looks on. You're doing more, you're gaining more, you're getting better. And the world sees it. A palm tree, on the other hand, is an endogen 
Say endogen. Somewhere a picture of an endogen will show up. On an endogen, all the new wood is at the center. It grows here, and so the older, harder wood is out here. The new wood is inside at the core. What does that tell us? A righteous person grows from the heart, the spirit. Their growth is not hindered by outside conditions. They weather. The palm tree weathers the storms because it's strong inside. Put a band around any tree, and the band will grow into the tree. It has no ability to break the band. Put a band around a palm tree, and a palm tree will snap the band as it grows. It's pushing from the inside to the outside. Nothing hinders the strength of the palm tree. No condition. The older the palm tree, the sweeter the fruit. Palm trees produce their best fruit when they get 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 200 years old. And in those beginning years, beginning decades, a palm tree, date, palm, can produce about 300 pounds of fruit. Dates, about that big around, 300 pounds. When it gets older, it can produce up to 600 pounds. And the fruit is sweeter in the old age than it is in its younger years. That's what he's telling us. Righteousness brings out our highest and most productive life. I want you to be like an evergreen, a cedar. I want you to be like a palm tree. See, if you just stop and and just take the names of the trees, you don't get the in-depth teaching that's there. I want you to be strong inward, but I want you to have that outer strength too to withstand the storms. I want you to bring forth fruit right to your dying breath. I want you to say to the enemy, I'm going to be better in my mature years than I ever was. That's what God promises the righteous person. This is your enticement to be righteous. Thank you so much for joining us on the telecast. I want to remind you uh, to be sure and go to our YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, and just click the button to sign up to become partners in ministry with us. There's so much we can do with YouTube. Tens of millions of people watch YouTube videos every single day. You can help us just by clicking the button. Just go to my YouTube channel and click the button and become a ministry partner with us. The law of righteousness is an incredible gift of God. Through Jesus, his son, he imparts to us his righteousness. The fruit of that righteousness is that we live the highest possible life. I know God is going to speak to you during this message. Come and join us at the church, 6 p.m. every Saturday night, Sunday morning, 9, 11 a.m., and then every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. in Fremont.